Several of you are aware of my fondness for the coffee at IHOP. Anytime I want to meet somebody or anybody asks, well, let's go get some coffee. Where do you want to go? I always say IHOP. 8th Street's good. Denny's is all right. There's a couple of places that, that have decent coffee. But if I had to, to pick, I had my druthers, as we say, I'd pick IHOP. I guarantee you one thing that has never happened at any point since I've ever gone to IHOP for coffee. Never once have I gotten lukewarm coffee. It's not been cold. It's not been lukewarm. It's always been hot, sometimes almost too hot. But have you ever been someplace where you've ordered coffee, the server brings you your cup, and you taste your coffee, and it's just... It's not ice cold, because that's not how you ordered it. It's just room temperature. I have. Again, not at IHOP, but I have had tepid coffee. And it's disgusting. Your first instinct is to spit it right out, because it's gross. Because that's not what coffee's about. Coffee is supposed to be, at least traditional coffee, is supposed to be hot. That's one of the qualities that those of us who like hot coffee, it's one of the qualities we like about it. It's one of the qualities that, that makes it satisfying, is that it's hot. But what does this have to do with anything to do with, with God or our souls or anything else? Well, there is a church to whom Jesus writes in Revelation chapter 3 that he describes as being tepid or lukewarm. And he goes so far as to say that they make him sick as well. This is the last church of the seven churches of Asia. In our list, as we have started with the church at Ephesus, all the way back in uh, Revelation chapter 2, starting in verse 1. And now we are finishing these seven churches of Asia as Jesus writes to them. And we've noted a couple of churches that there was nothing bad said about them. We've noted several churches where there was some good and some bad that Jesus had to address. But then we've also noted some congregations where there was nothing good and only bad said about them. So as we begin to talk about Laodicea, the church at Laodicea, here's some, some, just some, some facts about it. Originally, it was called Diospolis. Diospolis, uh, the city of Zeus is what that means. It was one of the wealthiest cities of its time. It was completely destroyed by an earthquake in 60 AD. And then they rebuilt it. They didn't take help from Caesar. They didn't take help from any of the surrounding cities. They rebuilt it all their own using their own funds. They were that wealthy. So this city is a place of great affluence. This is a city that had a lot of advanced amenities. That picture that we showed a little while ago, this is a pipe sewer system that they had that was advanced, really in some ways, even by our standards today in some places. This is one of those sewer systems that was built so well that it still exists. It contained a pipe system, aqueduct, and a medical school, which made it very popular as well. Laodicea is mentioned in Colossians chapter 2 quite a bit. And even in chapter 4 and in verse 16, as he's writing to the Colossians, he informs them, I want you to uh, send this, once you've read this epistle, send it to the Laodiceans, and then you receive the letter that I sent to the Laodiceans, and you read that as well. And I, I would have been fascinated to hear what Paul may have said to the Laodiceans, Obviously, it wasn't anything more than what we already have because we've given all things that pertain to life and godliness as God has given to it by inspiration of the Holy Spirit. But Paul says he wrote an epistle to the Laodiceans. But by the time that John, and for that matter, Jesus is narrating this letter, and John is writing these things in the book of Revelation in the 90s AD, some things have happened. The church has started to falter and Jesus starts out in verse 14. He says, To the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things says the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. 
Now, as we've noted, in his address to all of the churches, at some point, Jesus hearkens back to chapter 1. When Jesus is shown through Revelation to John, how he's described is often a part of this address by Jesus to one of the churches of Asia. But this particular address seems to harken back to chapter 1, verse 5. In verse 5, John as he's writing to the saints of the churches of Asia, he says, and from Jesus Christ, verse 5, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and the ruler over the kings of the earth. But notice Jesus refers to himself as the amen. A lot of times we use the term amen. We use it to end our prayers, as the example is in the Bible. But the term amen means so let it be, or verily. Uh, this is see a sealed statement. And that's why we end it with amen. All of the saints together, we say amen, so let it be. It's putting a seal on our petition to the Lord. Well, Jesus says he is the amen in verse 14. He is the seal. He is the so let it be. He's the guarantee, as well as the faithful and true witness. He's faithful and true. Which is to say, his testimony, the things that he says, is accurate. Not only is his testimony about Jehovah and the means by which we come to Jehovah, I am the way, the truth, and the life, not only is that accurate, but the observations that Jesus has made to the other six churches, the observation he's about to make to Laodicea, that's accurate as well. Everything Jesus says, he is a faithful and true witness. There is no deceit, no lying in the things that he says. And then he says, the beginning of the creation of God. It's kind of an odd way to say that. Jesus is the beginning of the creation of God. Some have asked, well, does that mean that Jesus was the first one to be created? Well, that's not what the scriptures say. In John chapter 1, starting in verse 1, in the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. <clears throat> Through that Word came all things that exist. Go on to verse 14, that word became flesh and dwelt among us. Paul makes the same observation in Colossians chapter 1, verse 15, that all things that are made were made through him and for him, verse 17. Jesus has always been, just as the Father has always been, the Holy Spirit has always been. What Jesus refers to is that Jesus was there at the beginning, he was there when everything was created. It was through him that all things are created. There might also be some reference, as some commentators have tried to connect, what Jesus says back in Revelation 1 verse 5, being the firstborn from the dead, means that he was the first to be raised, never to die again. And so from the perspective of the creation of those saved, those raised from the dead, Jesus was the beginning of that. And that's, that's true. But as we consider the fact that the address that Jesus offers to all of these churches has to do, we've noticed that there's connection from his address to what he's going to deal with talking to these people. The types of characteristics that he brings out about himself has a direct link or relationship to what he's going to describe about the church to whom he's writing. And I suggest to you that what he's bringing out is about his authority, the power, the fact that he has been there all the way from the beginning, that all things that were created were created through him. I suggest that's the connection that Jesus is making. Because when we go to verse 15... Jesus, as we, he starts with all of the churches, he says, I know your works. That's what he says. But that phrase, I know your works, is neither good nor bad. That is simply, it's a neutral statement of observation. 
I know your works. Now, for some of the churches, that's a good thing. Because some of the churches were doing that which was good. I know your works. That you are faithful, that you are, are standing for my name's sake, you're suffering. But then for some churches, it's a bad thing. But the simple statement is, I know your works. From that point on, nothing good is said regarding the character of this congregation. What Jesus says is, I know your works, and now he's going to begin to describe that state in which the congregation is in. I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. Verse 15. I could wish, other translations have, I would that you were cold or hot. Verse 16. So then because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. This is what Jesus says about the church in Laodicea. In regard to, in association with their works, there's some connection here. He says, I know your works, but you are neither cold nor hot. He says, I wish you were cold or hot. Well, why is that, Jesus? Why is it that you, that you would have them either cold or hot and not in the middle? I mean, at least... There's something there, right? Well, with regard to the idea of being cold or a lack of faith, a lack of willingness to do what God says, a lack of uh, conviction, and there were some congregations like the church at Sardis that, that they had a name that they were alive but are dead. I think that would be characterized as being cold because they're dead. But see, Jesus was able to address the specific issues that were going on in Sardis and say, these are the things that you need to fix as it pertained to their service to God, whether it was their works or their attitude. Those congregations that were hot, fervent, in fact, the term fervent in Romans chapter 12 and in verse 11, that we are to be fervent in spirit, not lacking in diligence, but fervent in spirit. That term fervent, it means hot, boiling. It is from the root term that we find here in verse 15, hot. Literally, just, it's hot. Well, the concept of fervent is more of a kind of a metaphorical representation of that. You're fervent in spirit. You're boiling. You're enthusiastic. You have energy associated with what you do. But this church isn't hot, and they're not cold. So then because you are lukewarm, you look up definitions of lukewarm or tepid, and the relationship or the, the, the concept of, of how those definitions are used with relation to attitude or characteristics of people, that which is without energy, that which is indifferent, that's how Jesus describes these brethren in Laodicea. You lack enthusiasm. You lack energy. You are indifferent. So when Jesus describes them, verse 16, you're neither cold nor hot, so I will spew you out of, your, out of my mouth, they're kind of just stuck in this state. It's not like they're warming up. <laughs> they're not cooling down, necessarily. Usually things are in flux, right? When you get coffee that's cold or, or lukewarm, it's usually because it started off hot, but then it just cooled off. It's, it's just been set out too long. Jesus says, you're lukewarm. You're not building up and getting better. They're not necessarily becoming colder. They're just there. They're just lukewarm. They're just maintaining the status quo. They're going through the motions. And as a result, when Jesus continues to describe this, he says, because you say, this is what you say to yourselves. This is what you think. Verse 17. I am rich and have become wealthy and have need of nothing. But you don't know that you are wretched and miserable, 
poor, blind, and naked. These people had deceived themselves. These brethren had convinced themselves, I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing. I'm checking all the boxes. I'm going to worship and I'm, I'm doing what I'm supposed to. And now they've become satisfied in their state. They've become complacent in their service. And regarding their conviction... The term faith, the root term of, that, of the term faith, it, it's rooted in the idea of conviction. I am convicted, therefore. Their conviction, you would think that the, the concept, if I'm convicted in something, I am therefore going to put forward energy because of that conviction. I'm going to put forth effort, enthusiasm. But complacency, indifference, speaks to a lack of conviction. Just, I'm just there. As I said in the bulletin, just bumps on a log, as we would say. They're just there. They didn't know what their true state was. Jesus has to point it out to them because they convinced themselves and deceived themselves into thinking that they're just fine. Not only that, but because of the city in which they lived. Remember we talked about what a prosperous city Laodicea was. So much money that they didn't need help in rebuilding their city when it was destroyed. They paid for it themselves. Because of their society in Laodicea, they had convinced themselves that I have need of nothing. I'm all good. I haven't a care in the world. I've got money in my bank. I am self-sufficient. Some have tried to link this to a lack of trust in Jehovah. I think it does show at least a lack of consideration of the blessings from Jehovah. Now, if you want to go so far as to say lack of trust, Jesus doesn't specifically say that, but you could certainly make that case. But it doesn't seem as though they're acknowledging the blessings that everything they have is from the Lord, even though their society is so wealthy. There are saints in other cities that aren't so fortunate. But that doesn't seem to be on their mind. And in addition... Being complacent, that term complacent means pleased with oneself. Pleased with oneself. Happy and content, not in the good way, with one's state. Satisfied. And if I'm satisfied and I'm complacent, that means the desire to grow, desire to learn, desire to mature isn't going to be there. Because I think I'm fine, and I'm doing fine, and I'm living fine, and everything's fine. So there's nothing really that I need to improve on. There's nothing I need to change, nothing I need to do better. But it also suggests that because of the lack of conviction, a lack of energy, a lack of enthusiasm, that suggests that maybe they aren't willing to sacrifice. They're not willing to put forward effort. They don't have zeal. Well, how do we know that they don't have zeal? Well, we'll address that in just a second. But one could make the association here that from what they're doing, at least in terms of, of their worship and everything else, Jesus doesn't say necessarily anything bad about that. But that's the the nature of going through the motions. The motions may be right, but if I don't have the right attitude and the right heart involved in the motions, do those motions have any meaning? Kind of what God or Jesus refers to as lip service. In vain do they worship me, teaching as, as commandments the doctrines of men, as he quoted from Isaiah. Vain worship is worship that has no meaning. Worship that has no purpose. You can do all the right things without the right reason, and it is vain. And I suggest to you that that's what's happened in Laodicea. Maybe they were worship, their worship was right in terms of what they were doing. They were singing and making melody in their hearts to the Lord. They were taking the Lord's Supper. Maybe they were doing all the right things, but they were just kind of, <clears throat> we're here. I chalk up my, my attendance for this Lord's Day. I'm here. 
And the energy, the enthusiasm, the love for God and for each other, the desire to talk to their neighbors about God's word may not have been what it needed to be. But some might ask, well, okay, it may not have been what it needed to be, but they were doing the right things. So isn't their works enough? Wouldn't they still be in a safe state? Just just because their, their enthusiasm, their conviction, their energy isn't what it needed to be, they're still okay, right? What does Jesus say in verse 16? Because you are lukewarm... I will vomit you out of my mouth. The term vomit here, without getting too graphic, is the idea of becoming sick to one's stomach and spewing it out. The Laodiceans, the church there, literally made Jesus sick to the point that Jesus said, I will spew you out of my mouth. This is not dissimilar to what Jesus told the Ephesians and in Revelation chapter 2, about removing their candlestick. If you do not change, if you don't go back and do the first works, I'll take away your candlestick. Meaning you will no longer be considered a congregation of my people. Now, when we talk about removing candlesticks, that's dealing with salvation. That's dealing with judgment. That's sin. When Jesus says, I will spew you out of my mouth, it's the same thing. This congregation was in sin. Why? Was it because they were doing something wrong with the Lord's Supper or or they weren't singing the right hymns? I don't believe so. I think they were doing the right things without the right heart. Without the right energy. Without the right attitude. And so they were just like robots, going through the motions without any real thought to what they were doing. And as a result, Jesus makes that statement. Jesus was about to cast out their lampstand when he says, I'll spew you out of my mouth. But Jesus does offer them motivation to fix themselves. Despite the fact that they had become lukewarm, You can heat yourselves back up again. Just like you can take coffee in a mug that has been sitting on your desk for too long and it's now a little cold, a little lukewarm, you can stick it in the microwave. About 30 seconds or so, stir it up, it's nice and hot again. (coughs) Jesus says in verse 18, I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire that you may be rich. Notice that Jesus offers counsel to effect change. If there was no hope of them becoming hot again, then Jesus is wasting his time in verse 18. Why would Jesus counsel them, give them advice to effect change if they can't fix it? Well, the fact is they can fix it. Jesus says in verse 16, I will vomit you out of my mouth, but there's still an opportunity to make yourself right. Because you say, I am rich, have become wealthy, and have need of nothing, you don't know. You don't realize. You haven't grasped the fact that while physically, in this life, you may may not be wretched or miserable or poor or blind or naked. Physically, they weren't any of those things. Spiritually, they were. Spiritually, they were poor and blind and naked. So how can I fix that, Jesus? I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire. Refined gold was especially valuable because it was pure gold. All the impurities had been filtered out. Pure gold. In a society that was as affluent and wealthy as Laodicea, this meant something. I counsel you to buy from me physical gold? No. But something so valuable and so wealthy or or expensive that it means something. Buy from me gold refined in the fire that you may be rich. Why? Because they're poor. White garments, he says, that you may be clothed, 
but the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed. But I have clothes, Jesus. Jesus isn't talking about physical clothes. They have all the physical clothes they could want. White garments. Pure, stainless, clean garments. That the shame of your nakedness... If you ever want to look up an interesting study, do a search for shame and nakedness, or naked together. And how closely those two are related throughout from Genesis with Adam and Eve... All the way through the Bible. Shame and nakedness go hand in hand. But Jesus, speaking from a spiritual perspective, says, I can give you white garments, but you may put on that the shame of the nakedness of your soul may not be revealed. And then remember that Laodicea is home to a medical school. He says, you are blind. I can give you I can anoint your eyes with eye salve that you may see. This is what Jesus can provide. You can buy from me gold. You can, provide, you can uh, buy from me white garments. You can buy from me eye salve so that your soul can be right. Verse 19. He says, As many as I love... I rebuke and chasten. The only reason for Jesus to rebuke and chasten is if they've done something wrong. And in the context of spirituality, when we talk about something wrong, we're talking about sin. These brethren were in sin. Thus, Jesus says, therefore, be zealous and repent. The only thing I have to repent of is sin. It's the only reason I would have to repent is if I've done something wrong. Job, in Job chapter 42, he says, I repent in dust and ashes. Why? Because he was wrong to question the wisdom of God. And he recognized that. These brethren must be... Notice the characteristic Jesus says that they must have in association with their repentance. Be zealous. Once again, this term is connected to the term that we saw up in verse 15, the term hot. It's connected to the term in Romans 12, verse 11, fervent. This term, zealous, it means hot, enthusiastic, determined, diligent. These are all the characteristics that Laodicea didn't have because they were lukewarm. They were not zealous. They were not enthusiastic. They were not determined. They were not diligent. They were not showing forth the qualities of conviction as they were supposed to. Why? Because they were happy in their society. The amenities of the physical life had lulled them to sleep. And so they convinced themselves that we're all good, I'm good, you're good. We don't really have to put that much effort into it now. We're saved. We can go through the motions and kind of skate our way on into heaven. Jesus says, that's not how it works. As many as I love, Jesus still loves them. But he's rebuking and chastening them. He goes on to say in verse 20, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. We sing a hymn often. Who at my door is standing? Jesus says, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him and he with me. Jesus will make his home with him. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. But what is required? This goes back to the idea of of faith only or belief only that some people teach. Jesus is standing at the door knocking. What is Jesus not going to do? I'm not going to open the door, barge in, and make you eat with me. If anyone hears my voice, I hear the voice of the Lord. What must I do? I must open the door. What is this in connection to? Be zealous and repent. There's a condition placed 
on these brethren coming back into what would be considered a saved state or being hot instead of lukewarm. They must be zealous and repent. They must answer the, hear, the call of the Lord. Open the door. Jesus, when they submit to Him, Jesus will make His home. And then in verse 21, To Him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with Me on My throne, as I also overcame and sat down with My Father on His throne. What did Jesus tell His disciples? Be of good cheer, for I have overcome the world. Be of good cheer. Why? Because I've overcome the world. And through me, what can we do? You can overcome the world as well. Well, in this case, at least the case with the Laodiceans, it doesn't seem like the world is causing them discomfort. If anything, it's providing too much comfort. They are too comfortable. To him who overcomes the lures of life, the lures of the world, the complacency that can set in. I will grant to sit with me on my throne as I overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. The lessons for us, both as a congregation and as individuals, are vast. We could almost go verse by verse and take applications for ourselves. But here's two main ones. We as a congregation of God's people cannot be cold, lacking faith, unwilling to do as God has told us to do, unwilling to, to obey. We can't be lukewarm either. We can't do all the right things without any thought or any consideration for what it is we're doing. We can come through those doors. We can sit in the pew every Sunday morning, every Wednesday night. We can check that box and it will mean absolutely nothing if we aren't doing it in spirit and in truth. As Jesus says, those who wish to worship Him must worship in spirit and in truth. We have to be a congregation that is hot, that is fervent, that is enthusiastic, that is constantly desiring to invite people to come to worship, that is constantly looking for ways to teach and to grow and to learn and to mature. We can't become complacent and satisfied and say, well, we have everything we need, we're good, we're just going to stay like we are. That goes into the individual application. We cannot allow the physical amenities of life to distract us from the zealous attitude that we must have, as the Laodiceans apparently did. Because compared to Laodicea, we might be even more wealthy in our country than the Laodiceans were in their city. We can go over to McDonald's and for three bucks we can get coffee and breakfast. And that coffee's hot. Three bucks. Despite inflation, despite some of the raising of prices, we still live in a blessed society. A rich and wealthy place. And if we aren't careful, all of the distractions, all of the access to the football games, all the access to the, the fun and entertainment, all of the things that we can distract ourselves with, can cause us to lose sight of the fact that we are to be pilgrims and sojourners on the earth. And as such, we are to be looking for a home in heaven. Just as Abraham and Sarah and Enoch and all the rest of the people of faith did. We can't become so complacent. We can relax physically. Sometimes you have to relax physically. Your body needs it. But the moment we start relaxing spiritually, the moment we start saying, okay, I'm good, I can just kind of glide on now. I can kind of skate through. I don't have to keep learning or keep growing. What was the whole point of what Peter says in 2 Peter, starting in chapter 1? Add to your faith virtue, to virtue knowledge, to knowledge, temperance, and so forth. Why? He's writing to people who are saved, people who are Christians, because you are never to be complacent. 
You've never, ever grown enough. You could have memorized the entire Bible, Old Testament, New Testament, forwards and backwards, and it won't be enough. We continue to grow. We continue to learn. Because that is the quality of conviction. The quality of conviction that demands effort, that demands enthusiasm, that demands energy. And if we lack that, we lack true conviction. True conviction, if we don't have true conviction, we don't have the main quality of what we call faith. If faith is the manifestation of true conviction, then if we lack true conviction, we don't have true faith. And if we don't have true faith, we can't get to heaven. That's the lesson that we learn from Laodiceans. That's the lesson we learn from what Jesus writes to the Laodiceans. And it's a lesson that we have to take to heart so that we don't fall into the same trap that they did in a society that would seem to be fairly similar. We offer an invitation this morning to those who are not Christians to hear Jesus' words in Mark chapter 16, verse 16, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Now there's a million and one ways to lose your soul. There's only one way to save it. And that's Jesus' way. If you believe and are willing to turn from your life to what God wants you to do, you're willing to confess that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, you can be baptized, have your sins washed away, and the Lord will add you to His body, to His church, those of us who are Christians. Especially for those of us who, quote-unquote, grew up in the church. We grew up going to church. We grew up around the Bible. And sometimes what can happen is when we kind of grow up into it, we can get the thought process, for those of us who are second and third and fourth generation Christians, we can get the thought process that I'm kind of grandfathered in. And somehow or another, that means that my standard that God's going to hold me to is going to be a little bit more lenient than the standard of everybody else. The same standard of behavior is required for us as is everyone else. The same, same standard of conviction, of zeal, is required for us as it will for everyone else. We have to continue to maintain the effort and the energy in loving the Lord, in worshiping Him, in serving each other, and in serving our neighbor as we did the day we were baptized. Let's make sure we're doing that. And if you need help in doing that, if you need help in any way for the salvation of your soul this morning, come forward as we stand and sing.